Welcome to People, Places, Planet Pod, the official podcast of the Environmental Law Institute, a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization working to ensure a healthy environment, prosperous economies, and vibrant communities founded on the rule of law. Environmental justice, a movement dating back to the civil rights era, is defined by EPA as the fair treatment and meaningful involvement of all people, regardless of race, color, national origin, or income with respect to the development, implementation, and enforcement of environmental laws, regulations, and policies. With the recent transition to the Biden-Harris administration, we have already started to see unprecedented attention to environmental justice, or EJ, by the federal government with early executive actions. Even before the Biden-Harris campaign brought EJ back into the federal spotlight, however, states were starting to implement EJ-focused legislation, a trend that has continued into 2021. In today's episode of the ELI Beverage and Diamond Environmental Justice Ground Truth series, Hillary Jacobs, environmental lawyer with a focus on environmental justice at Beverage and Diamond, speaks with Representative Dr. Carla Drenner and Senator Rebecca Saldana, legislators in states that have recently passed or currently have EJ legislation pending. Well, thank you, Hillary, for joining us today. I'm excited for another episode of the Ground Truth series. Hi, Dominic, and thank you so much for having me today. I'm delighted to be here with Representative Drenner and Senator Saldana. Uh, Before we launch into the podcast, I'll just provide a, a little bit of background information on both of our wonderful and accomplished panelists. Uh, So Dr. Carla Drenner was first elected to the Georgia House of Representatives in 2000 and is currently serving her 10th term. Representative Drenner currently represents the Avondale Estates community in the Eastern Atlanta metropolitan area. She's presently sponsoring HB 431, legislation that would incorporate environmental justice considerations into environmental permitting decisions. She has not one but two PhDs, one in public policy analysis and administration and another in occupational safety and health. She has written several books and is a graduate professor for Purdue University Global, where she teaches in the public administration program. Welcome, Dr. Drenner. Senator Rebecca Saldana is the Washington State Deputy Majority Leader and represents the southeastern portion of Seattle. Senator Saldana introduced SB 5141, also known as the Healthy Environment for All or HEAL Act, comprehensive environmental justice legislation that was signed into law by Governor Inslee on May 17th, 2021. Prior to assuming office in 2016, Senator Saldana served as an organizer for several local unions and served as the executive director of Puget Sound Sage, a nonprofit that promotes affordable and equitable housing and transportation policies, environmental justice, and workers' rights. Welcome, Senator Saldana. The group will discuss the history and evolution of each piece of legislation, the process of working with stakeholders in developing and, where applicable, passing the legislation and the future of each piece of legislation. Welcome and thank you both so, so much for joining us today. Uh, So let's talk a little bit about each bill or law and let's start with Dr. Drenner. Uh, Could you please give us a two minute overview of HB 431, which you have sponsored? And specifically, if you could please give us a brief summary of what this legislation accomplishes, how it came to even be on the table and where it currently is in the legislative process. That would be great. Hi, Hillary. Thank you for the question and for the opportunity to uh, be here today. The bill uh, originated, uh, House Bill 431, as a result of a confluence of events that occurred within the state of Georgia that called into question the actions of the Environmental Protection Division. Like other states, Georgia's Environmental Protection Division has a duty to honor and uphold the law and to protect the environmental and public health of all residents of the state of Georgia. The first issue happened in my home county of DeKalb, where my legislative delegation was dismayed 
by the EPD's decision to violate this duty and issued a solid waste permit that never should have been issued to a large industrial facility in the middle of a black neighborhood. In this particular situation, EPD ignored the county's direct and repeated statements that the facility's operation would be in violation of the county's solid waste management plan. EPD completely disregarded the county's policy that was designed and intended to protect its citizens from environmental injustices. The second example is a statewide issue. Georgia is one of just two states in the entire country with an approved coal combustion residues permit program, or CCR. For several years now, myself and other Georgia state legislators have opposed companies' plan to close in place its CCR surface impoundments at five sites in Georgia, leaving nearly 500 million tons of coal ash, which will remain submerged in groundwater with no bottom liner. Despite our continued opposition and concerns raised by countless residents and community groups, the Georgia Environmental Protection Division has indicated that it will issue CCR permits for those coal ash ponds to use our aquifers as a dumping ground in perpetuity. What is known about these coal ash ponds is that they are already contaminating groundwater and all five of those close in place sites are currently in assessment monitoring because contamination has been found at levels above groundwater protection standards. Environmental racism is a serious and long-standing problem in Georgia. Black and poor communities have suffered far too long from polluting, noisy, and, uh, and unsightly industrial solid waste facilities that EPD has permitted to operate in their neighborhoods. House Bill 431 was introduced to address not only these examples, but the countless others that I did not talk about today to ensure that full community input and participation and collaboration into permit decisions whose impact can last for years, if not decades. And in many communities across our states where this input has never been collected or simply not heeded or ignored, those impacts have been hurtful. This is the leg legacy that is that I am hoping to address with House Bill 431. Right now, legislatively, this bill sits in the Natural Resource Committee. Thank you so much for that background, Dr. Jenner. That was extremely elucidating. And I'd like to turn to Senator Saldana. Um, your bill is in a very different stage in the legislative process. And so, I was hoping you could give us a brief, again, two minute high level overview of what the HEAL Act achieves and, and what its current status is. And I'm sort of laughing because just days before this recording, it was signed into law, but I'll, I'll let you speak to that now. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Hillary, and so great to, to hear uh, what's happening in Georgia, um, Representative Jenner. So Senate Bill 5141 did get signed into law um, on Monday, well, see if I remember the dates, Monday, May 17th, I believe um, was the date. Um, and um, it was about seven years worth of work. Um, and um, this was the second time I introduced uh, legislation, we call this the HEAL Act 2.0. Um, the first version um, turned into a um, study and a task force uh, that worked for two years and came up with a recommendation. So on a high level, the HEAL Act um, 2.0, uh, it does a couple of things. It establishes in law definitions for environmental justice. It requires seven of our state agencies 
to, um, to um, be covered by this bill. It establishes an interagency work group and a permanent environmental justice council, the makeup of which includes a majority of representatives from impacted communities. It also sets timelines for guidance, recommendations, and implementation of environmental justice assessments, measurements, and public reporting of progress. Um, and so what our plan is, is that it actually changes the way that um, those seven agencies do their work. And um, we hope that now that it's been signed into law, we will start to um, begin the formation of the Environmental Justice Council. The last thing it does, it actually continues um, ongoing funding for our health disparities map um, that is housed at the Department of Health and Ecology. Excellent. Thank you so much for that overview, Senator Saldana. I'd now like to talk about one thing that Georgia's bill and Washington's HEAL Act, which was just signed into law, have in common. As we discussed in the first episode of Ground Truth, New Jersey signed legislation into law last year requiring the New Jersey Department of Environmental Protection to consider environmental justice impacts in issuing certain environmental permits. Now, both of your bills make environmental justice a key consideration in issuing certain agency actions. As Senator Saldana just mentioned, the HEAL Act requires seven different Washington agencies to consider environmental justice. And Georgia's legislation expressly requires the Georgia Environmental Protection Division to consider environmental justice in issuing environmental permits. Now, Senator Saldana, I know that the HEAL Act's inclusion of environmental justice and agency actions was a part of the Washington Environmental Justice Task Force's 2020 recommendations upon which the HEAL Act was partially founded, as you just mentioned. Uh, but for Dr. Drenner and Georgia's legislation, I'm wondering what was the impetus for this inclusion? I noticed many similarities between HB 431 and New Jersey's environmental justice law. Thank you, Hillary, and thank you, Senator Saldana. Uh, what an impressive piece of legislation uh, that you have just passed in the state of Washington. Georgia's bill, as you mentioned, Hillary, does mirror, mirror New Jersey's landmark environmental justice law. I, mainly because uh, New Jersey's law, uh, along now with Washington State's law, promises to have wide-reaching effects. Similarly to New Jersey, under Georgia's proposed legislation, applicants seeking new or renewed permits for specific categories of facilities cited in overburdened communities must submit an environmental justice impact statement that would evaluate the potential cumulative environmental and public health stressors associated with the permitted activity. This would require Georgia's EPD to publish a list of over, overburdened communities that it doesn't do now defined as any census block group with significant low income, minority, or non-English speaking populations. The legislation, again, similar to New Jersey, would empower EPD to impose conditions on or deny a permit in its entirety based on the agency's review of the applicant's environmental justice statement. The law, which is very significant uh, to my community and to other communities across the state, would introduce a significant public engagement and notification process on its applicants, thereby increasing engagement mandates on, on uh, potential businesses that would be interested, uh, like my example, uh, in of an industry that came into 
one of my communities uh, did not give really proper notice. So Hillary, New Jersey had kind of set the 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 stage for other states to to pass groundbreaking legislation that would address environmental justice issues within our respective states. Got it. Thank you, uh, Carla. I, I, we've been saying this at Beverage and Diamond since New Jersey passed its, its environmental justice law. So it's great to confirm from you what we have suspected has been and would happen that that law would set a precedent and provide a model for future states. And I know your state is not the only one with similar legislation pending. So it's great to see that ripple effect starting. Um, so thank you for sharing all of that. And Senator Saldana, um, first of all, I failed to congratulate you at the outset on the fact that this legislation has not only passed, but also been signed into law. So I would like to just take a moment to congratulate you on that momentous achievement um, and then launch into a similar question. So I know that you know all of this very well, but for the benefit of our listeners, I'm just gonna give a little background. Washington's legislation takes a slightly different approach to environmental permitting, uh, requiring an evaluation of environmental justice considerations for, quote, significant agency actions, end quote, which includes programmatic activities such as rulemakings and grant programs, but does not expressly include environmental permitting decisions. It also allows agencies to determine which of its additional actions to trigger an environmental justice analysis, which could feasibly include permitting. Could you please explain the impetus for this approach and, you know, as opposed to specifically requiring and, and expressly stating that it applies to environmental permitting decisions? Sure, it's a great question. I think um, one thing that's important to know in Washington State, right, is that, you know, environmental law has a long precedent here, and um, we also have um, really um, kind of really strong um, government to government relations with our sovereign nations. And, and so I think those are important, two important things. So on the environmental, we have um, for a long time SEPA, which is our state version of um, NEPA. And, um, and so that um, we have a process already set up for large um, sightings and private projects and permitting um, to look at environmental impacts. What um, we as, um, is the case across our country and um, because of institutional and long lasting racism is that and depending on where you live in our city um, and what your zip code is uh, um, unfortunately determines so much of your health and wealth um, and opportunities um, uh, and so that has been something that has um, been an issue for our environmental justice communities for a long time and for my community that I represent, which is our historic red line communities. I, um, we are um, surrounded by our, I our inter interstate um, highway system and um, adjacent to all of the port and the Superfund. And so what um, I think was really critical for um, the environmental justice communities and for me is that it's not enough um, to, ha if we're doing EJ environmental justice at the permitting stage, it's too, it, it becomes too late if that's the only place we're looking at it. Um, and so what we, um, you know, focus on um, is how do we make sure that environmental justice is at the forefront of how our agencies look at strategy um, at their strategic plans? How are they um, thinking about investments? And how are they shaping um, uh, request legislation um, to the legislature? Is that's where we want environmental justice? It also in um, the Heal Act, you know, requires um, you know uh, community uh, best practices around community engagement for each of these agencies that needs to be done, and to make sure that they're incorporating environmental justice principles into their planning. 
with, of course, the hope that that it shapes how programs get implemented or how um, SEPA might um, uh, begin and, and have these incorporated in how they're doing their permitting. But um, it was a hot button issue um, for our um, business and industry community, and we did not um, want to um, have that be the thing that prevented us from moving forward. So we really de-emphasized um, what the specific impact is on the permitting and really focused this this particular piece of legislation um, much more um, um, earlier on um, and to try to integrate um, upstream um, how environmental justice um, gets incorporated into these agencies. Um, and so, yeah, so that's really the intent is that we're really trying to um, change um, over time, um, you know, the discrepancies that we have in health and um, life expectancy um, for our communities that have been our historically overburdened and, and um, vulnerable populations. Thank you for that. That's an interesting and important take and comments on environmental justice in general. I am particularly focused on your comment that if if we're only considering EJ at the permitting stage, then we're too late. And so I like the approach that you've described that the law attempts to take, which is um, injecting EJ into the programs and structures that then yield the permitting decisions. So that's really interesting and so important. You mentioned that some interaction with industry stakeholders and, and not wanting the bill to be held up by permitting. Um, so I'm wondering how the HEAL Act evolved over time and you know how you worked with stakeholders in developing the bill and you just gave one example. And so I would be interested to hear a little bit more about that. Um, just from your perspective, you know, different types of stakeholders, industry, community groups, and, and what their perspectives were. Sure, I, I'm happy to build on that. So this um, HEAL Act, um, the, the primary um, have, um, proponents for it is um, the Front and Centered Coalition, which is a, an alliance of about 60 community-based organizations that um, represent um, overburdened um, communities, um, Black and Indigenous um, community organizations, and um, kind of historic social justice groups. So they have been doing a lot of um, community listening sessions and hearing from folks. And so, you know, what my earlier, our early iterations were really written um, in, um, in co-authorship with um, the front and centered community groups. And, um, and, and so that is unique, I think, in um, at least a lot of how state legislative um, other colleagues work in terms of how they write their legislation. And so, I mean, we did a lot with um, a lot of rewrites and with um, with the community stakeholders in the room, with our agency representatives in the room and on um, our policy team. And, and I think early iterations, we really were trying to have the EJ Council be completely um, oversight um, and shaping guidance. And, um, and, and that was where we got a lot of pushback. And so over time, um, we really tried to retain as much of that um, integrity of um, front, you know, most impacted communities having real say at the at the start and throughout processes, and um, and also building in um, real capacity into the interagency, uh, into each of the agencies, and building a cohort of learning, basically, and always improving um, with the formation of the interagency work group, and that the interagency work group and the EJ Council then really begin to have more iterative. Um, conversations um, to help shape how we are building out um, over the next uh, year and a half, basically um, really the foundations for um, how, um, what are the guidance for incorporating it into strategic plans, um, review of the community um, engagement plans, 
and um, how you know what is identified as significant agency actions and how those how EJ assessments um, will be um, prioritized and um, implemented at each of the agencies in a way that uh, makes sense for them um, and that will really result in outcomes. Um, so the other piece over the next two years is for them to identify what those um, what how will we measure success how will we uh, measure that we are making improvement over time um, and that is where the ej council really helps shape that what we're measuring um, and is able to provide that insight back to the legislature to the groups and to the governor um, so that whole process was very um iterative in terms of what resulted in uh, getting signed by the governor uh, the other um, area I think where um, a lot of conversation was is really around how envir this environmental justice policy interacts with um, our already well-established consultation um, with our sovereign nations. And so, um, again, many um, changes in the language and definitions um, that, you know, resulted in, um, I think, really um, strong language about making sure that we are um, protecting um, the historic um, cultural um, lands and access to um, their um, cultural foods um, and um, practices. And so, you know, hoping that this becomes an, uh, a way to um, strengthen um, our sovereign nation's abilities to um, protect their um, their members as well. And I know you talked asked about industry. I mean, I think this really was, um, you know, in conversations, but um, I mean, the, it, there was there was a lot of opposition throughout, although we continued to engage with, um, you know, in the task force, we had business representation from our um, largest, largest um, um, business lobby, and the Association of um, Washington Businesses, and um, they stayed engaged with us, um, the builders and permitters, and, um, uh, you know, there's a lot of ongoing conversation about siting. Um, you know, there's other pieces of legislation we passed this year around um, clean fuels, um, as well as a cap on um, carbon and um, beginning a, a trade and investment program. And so uh, people want to see what, you know, biofuels, they want to see, um, um, you know, more opportunities for manufacturing here in Washington. And, um, and so I think that we have a good structure here, but all of the details of how that um, will we'll pull, how this will interact um, with our other policies um, is definitely um, work that lies ahead of us. Understood. Thank you. Um, and I have one more question for you before I turn back to Dr. Jenner for another question. Um, so it sounds like the HEAL Act, the development of it, it, as you said, it was an iterative process. It was incredibly thoughtful. But after, now that all is said and done and it is signed into law, what would you say to those who think that the HEAL Act does not go far enough to advance environmental justice in the state of Washington? I mean, I think that um, what it, I mean, I think part of it is like what we're doing is trying to actually change structure, system, and um, the culture of Washington state um, agencies to make sure that they're incorporating AJ. I think that. Um, the next important piece is to make sure you know who is going to be appointed and serve on the Environmental Justice Council. This inaugural council will be incredibly um, um, important um, to making sure that um, the HEAL Act actually implements as it needs to. Um, I think that it's more where where a lot more criticism has occurred. I think in 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 Washington State around um, this legislative session are the other environmental policies that passed. Um, the big one being cap and trade, which um, you know rightfully uh, um, environmental justice and frontline communities have uh, major um, criticisms um, of that um, policy as it's been implemented in other states. And, um, and whether um, you know we can really get compliance and um, and the kind of regulation to demand performance. Um, 
an improvement of EJ community health um, and air. Um, but, and so I think it, the way that it was written, it, it does have the EJ council providing the oversight um, and it is, um, it is subject to HEAL Act. Um, however, um, the, the, we have to prove that the HEAL Act will provide us sufficient teeth um, to be able to have our agency and that the agencies will have sufficient uh, support to be a stand to withstand um, the pressures of lobbyists and the pressures of industry um, so that they actually do um, incorporate EJ and demand um, performance in how we um, set up the rules and how we set up um, implementation and enforcement. Thank you so much, Senator Saldana, for that response. Um, I'd like to turn back to Dr. Jenner for a moment. So the legislation HB 431 includes a number of different defined terms, which are really fundamental and foundational to environmental justice. Um, so Dr. Jenner, I'm wondering what your considerations were keeping in mind that this was influenced by New Jersey's legislation, um, but in defining key terms such as an overburdened community or an environmental justice community. And I'm curious how the definitions that are in this legislation reflect the realities of environmental justice in your state, Dr. Drenner. Thank you, Hillary. And I, before I answer that question directly, I, I just want to make a comment uh, to Senator Saldana uh, and uh, your efforts uh, in the state of Washington, as I as I was listening to you, I was thinking about uh, environmental justice, and the comment was environmental justice at the permitting stage is just a little late, uh, and environmental justice uh, in a, in a southern red state, right? I would I would offer that perhaps that that beginning uh, that a developing state in environmental justice is is Georgia, right? Is is somewhere that nowhere in the code, nowhere in any of the regulations is that concept even mentioned. So uh, going from a developing state to a mature state as as where where you're from is is totally uh, different. So I picked uh, New Jersey uh, in particular uh, to define uh, and begin the conversation in Georgia with the thought that the the requirements for a permit would begin with facilities that already have a permit, right? Where they would um, existing environmental permits because they're already releasing contaminants that could cause bioaccumulative, you know, health impacts on residents would be the beginning point uh, instead of the uh, the end point, if, if you, uh, if you uh, understand what I mean by that. So, New Jersey was a good example of uh, for, for me to come in and I, I will say this, that the legislation is is sitting in the natural resource and the environment committee. And I had a conversation with the chair about the legislation and the question that she posed to me was, she was unfamiliar with the term environmental justice. So, not only is Georgia in the developing stage, I would say that it's like in the infancy stages of awareness of what exactly conceptually does it mean to have facilities that impact, you know, commun communities in a, in a negative way. Um, Georgia governors and its leadership oftentimes refer to itself as like the number one state to do business in, right? Which kind of equates to, uh, if you live here, that there are lax 
environmental regulations and only minimal requirements uh, in which to, uh, you know, that you have to adhere to. So I hope that answers the question, Hillary, uh, that really the requirements for the permits for the facilities the legislation began with those facilities that already had environmental permits. Absolutely, um, Dr. Jenner, I think that does answer the question. And, and I'm in particular, I'm very pleased that you discussed how environmental justice looks in the state of Georgia, as opposed to the state of Washington. I think we were super delighted to have both of you here, just because both of you are wonderful advocates and state legislators, but um, also because I think the two states, Georgia and Washington, foil each other very nicely in terms of how environmental justice can play out in different political environments. Um, so with that said, um, Dr. Drenner, do you see your sponsored legislation being passed into law? And if so, on what time frame? And what has to happen for this to occur? I've been in the legislature for uh, 20 years now, and I remember a lobbyist telling me that all good ideas take 15 years. Uh, all good ideas on the West Coast maybe take half that amount of time. Uh, but, you know, things are changing in Georgia, right? For example, in the last election cycle, you know, who would have thought that Georgia would be the determining state uh, that would that would provide us with uh, democratic control of the U.S. Senate, right? So I think moving forward, uh, the possibility to pass a bill like House Bill 431 under a Democratic governor uh, in the next uh, election cycle is a distinct possibility. And so I'm I'm hopeful uh, at the very least um, within a Democratic governor's term, which uh, is quite likely to happen uh, next year. So House Bill 431 is is just the beginning of a conversation. I, I don't believe it's going to take 15 years. Um, and I'm very hopeful that whereas the, the House and Senate may still remain under uh, the, the majority control of the Republicans due to redistricting is far likely that the state as a whole could move into the blue column and give environmental justice legislation uh, the, the nudge that it needs to gain the awareness in order for a bill to pass. Thank you, Dr. Jenner, and you know, we'll be watching closely over the next couple of years to see how this all shakes out in, in your state. Um, to close out our podcast recording today, I just would love to hear from each of you about why you've chosen to focus on environmental justice at this point in your careers. Uh, why now and what are your hopes for the future of environmental justice in your communities. And I think, Dr. Jenner, you touched on that a little bit, but let's stick with you for the moment, please. Well, thank you, Hillary. I, I didn't just choose environmental justice. Uh, this has been my, my career focus, uh, not only as a legislator, but as, uh, as someone who worked in the, in the corporate and industrial sector. You know, all of us, have the right to live in a clean and healthy environment. And the truth is that uh, many people don't have access to clean air, water, and land. And those without access to these fundamental resources are disproportionately minority and low-income communities. You know, I'm a Georgian by choice and a West Virginian by birth. and. I know what it's like to live in a poor state where coal interests dominate and mountaintop mastectomies are prevalent and waters that are overly 
polluted uh, and carry lifelong health impacts to its residents. So where you live matters. Uh, where you live and who represents you matters. And environmental justice is is something that matters to everyone, no matter where you live. And whether I'm in the legislature or in the private sector, I my efforts to continue to champion uh, communities that are disproportionately impacted by polluting facilities uh, will continue. Uh, thanks, Hillary, and I appreciate the opportunity to share my comments today. Thank you so much. And Senator Saldana, um, so I'd like to turn to you now. Why have you turned to environmental justice at this point in your career? And what are your hopes for the future of environmental justice in, in your community? I'm a daughter of a farm worker and I have relatives down in Southern Texas. And I have had the privilege of living in one of the most beautiful green places uh, the state of Washington, but I also just lived around the corner from a super fund, uh, the Duwamish um, River, that is, um, you know, very polluted. It also is where my my father worked in a factory um, for almost thirty years, um, and it was one of the most polluting factories um, along the Duwamish. And so this intersection of um, how um, how immigrants have and how uh, people of um, low income folks, you know, how we have opportunities to be able to provide for our families should be done in a way that creates healthy communities for all of us. And that I think that the way that we are going to um, address climate um, has to be centered around racial justice. And that is what environmental justice is all about. And I, I think that the only way that we can grow an economy that's going to work for everyone, that is going to be clean and healthy and inclusive, is by making sure that we all understand environmental justice. And um, I was remembering what Representative um, Jenner was saying is like, you know, people don't understand what environmental justice is in Georgia. Definitely, they don't either in Washington state. I mean, so many of my colleagues, you know, will get stuck on what does it mean? And so we now have a definition. It's in statute. Um, and so I hope that it becomes more of a grounding place for all of us um, as we try to uh, make sure that um, we're addressing the environment um, and our economy in a way that is um, complementary, um, not at war. Well, thank you again to both of you, Representative Drenner and Senator Saldana. This has been such a delight to have you and to talk about environmental justice in, in Washington and Georgia, respectively. Uh, we can't thank you enough for being here today. Thank you for tuning in to People, Places, Planet Pod, brought to you by the Environmental Law Institute. We would like to hear from you. So please send us your questions, comments, and ideas to podcast at ELI.org. And if you're interested in learning more about our work, attending one of our events, reading our publications, or becoming a member, please visit our website at www.eli.org.